All right, open your Bible to Acts chapter 2. Uh, we will be in, uh, we'll start in verse 22 uh, today. A- A- Acts chapter 2, verse 22. All right, here's, here we'll go. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Now just remember, uh, Peter is standing and saying these things and he's declaring these things to people in the community right then, specifically people of Israel, men of Israel who he's saying this to. And so he's like, you did this, you killed, you were crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope for you will not be, you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, so this Peter again says this. I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up and of that we are witnesses." Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Let me pray for us and we'll jump into today's text. God, we, we love you. We need you. We are thankful for your word that it is true. We can trust it. And I pray that you'll help this this man, this paltry man today, say the things that you would have me say today for the glory of Jesus Christ. And I pray it in his name. Amen. All right. So uh, back in verse 14, look back in verse 14, that same chapter. This is what uh, you can read that Peter said. He said this, but Peter standing with the 11 lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. And again, in verse 22, he's gaining their attention again. I, if I do that, so he basically says, give ear to my words. If I want you to pay attention to something, what do I do from up here? I bang on the pulpit, right? Listen, that's, that's what I say. Listen. And so he's doing the same thing. He's like, hey, I need you to pay attention. Don't be distracted by anything. He didn't want them to miss what it was that he had once said in the previous verse. And he might have sensed them looking away. He might have sensed them nodding off or being distracted by somebody spilling their coffee or whatever the thing was. He was like, man, uh, I need you to pay attention, And so he says this in verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. And so my first question or my first thoughts as I was really preparing to preach is like, who is this Peter guy? I mean, Who is this guy that's standing so bold, who's standing up in front of thousands of people and proclaiming this message with such conviction and such uh, uh, a strong message that he was actually saying at the time? Who is this Peter guy? Because honestly, uh, not too far back at the end of the gospel accounts, here's what was going on. There was this uh, dispute that broke out among the disciples. This was uh, pre-Jesus going to the cross, so pre-crucifixion pre-resurrection, pre to the time that we are here in Acts. And, and so there was this dispute that broke out between the apostles on who would be the greatest in the kingdom. I mean, can you imagine that whole thing that they're, they're 
assembled together. They're with Jesus. I can imagine Jesus is kind of sitting back like this, just watching this, and uh, he's going SMH, you know, uh, uh, because he's watching these dudes go, I think I'll be the greatest in the kingdom. No, I'm going to be the one that sits at his right hand. Why are you going to be the one that sits at his right hand? Maybe I'll be the one that sits at his right hand. There's this dispute over who's going to be greater, you or me, when it came to the kingdom. And Jesus reminded them, actually he reminded all of them, say all of them. He reminded all of them, he said, you're all going to sit at my table in the kingdom that's going to come. And so at that point, I mean, can you imagine those dudes are like, yes, we're going to be at the table, bro. Uh, and, and so remember, the disciples of that time, they were, think, they were not thinking about a heavenly kingdom. What were they thinking about? An earthly kingdom. They were convinced that Jesus was going to start this revolution and he was going to overthrow this Roman government and they were going to be back in power again. That's what the disciples thought because that's really all they could really grasp, get their minds around to say he must be setting up this earthly kingdom. And at the same time, so while all this is going on, uh, Jesus told uh, uh, Peter, he said, hey, I'm going to pray for you. In the middle of his kind of, you know, uh, gregarious actions, Jesus is like, hey, bro, I I'm going to pray for you because Satan has asked to sift you like sand. To kind of just let you go through the sieve and sift you and kind of make you fall apart and sift you like sand. And, and, and so Jesus said, when I'm going to pray for you, and he did pray for him, and he said, after I do that, and after this happens, I want you to turn back and I want you to strengthen your brothers. After all this happens to you, you go back and, and, and tell the story about what's happened to you. And Peter was like, bro, that's not happening to me. If they come after you, they got to go through me. They got to go through me if they're going to get to you. <laughs> and Jesus was like, man, I, I appreciate your fervor. I appreciate your, you know, coming at me, bro. But before the cock crows, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, nah, that's not going to be me. I won't do that to you, Jesus. You read in John chapter 18, the account of Jesus' arrest and his trials and his scourging and him being taken out to be crucified and interwoven into those stories that you go back and forth about Jesus going back and forth between the uh, rulers of that time. Interwoven into those stories is the very story about uh, a Peter sometimes just being standing by a fire or, or just standing with a group of people and, and people ask him, hey, you're that guy that follows Jesus. And what did he say? Wasn't me. Hey, you're that guy. I, I've seen you before. I've seen you hanging out with that Jesus character. And he was like, wasn't me. It's like, hey, wait a minute. I recognize your accent. Your accent gives you away. I think you're one of his people. He was like, hey, wasn't me. And all of a sudden, what happened? Cock crows. Yeah. The reminder that what Jesus had said was actually coming to fruition. We also read in John chapter 21 that after Jesus' resurrection, so, so Jesus goes to the cross, he dies on the cross. We talked about last week all the events that surrounded uh, the goings on uh, whenever Jesus died on the cross. And, and so, so post-resurrection, uh, we see in John chapter 21 that he asked Peter if he loved him. Remember that story in John chapter 21? Three times he asked him, do you love me? And every time Peter was like, yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, I love you. The third time he's asked, and Jesus would tell him, then feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Third time he asked him, Peter, do you love me? And he was like, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He's like, feed my lambs. And we see such this dichotomy of Peter through this time, this big rambunctious guy that when they came to arrest Jesus, you know, he... He's so haphazard with his sword, he cuts off. I'm, I think he was trying to cut the dude's head off that came to arrest Jesus, but he just got his ear. Uh, that'd be like me with a sword, you know, just like swinging it, you know. You guys, I'm going to get something. He got an ear, you know, that, that Jesus put back on and healed the guy. 
And, and then you get through the, the crucifixion where or as Jesus is on his way to the cross and, and he denies him three times. And now he comes to Jesus and, and Jesus is restoring him because he knows that he's kind of, he's, he's wounded, he's, he's embarrassed because Jesus told him that he would do this very thing. And, and now he's embarrassed that it actually came to be, came to fruition. And so as we see this somewhat gregarious Peter move from staunch warrior on team Jesus to denier of even knowing who Jesus is, uh, we see gentle and merciful Jesus with him and he restores him even after his denial. How many of you know that one of Jesus' attributes is mercy? How many of you know that you can find mercy and help in your time of need. Sometimes in our greatest depths of our sin, we find mercy from our king, not unlike Peter did. Scripture tells us that Jesus ascends back to the Father. Uh, he promises to, spend, to, uh, to send the Holy Spirit, the helper, to come back. Jesus said, it's better that I go away, and I'm going to send the helper to come. And, and, uh, and then we see in Acts chapter 2, the beginning of Acts chapter 2, that they're in the upper room, and, and, and the Spirit comes and with power, with this great noise, and these flames that rest above their head. And it's like, it's like it, all of a sudden, it's like, pow, shazam, uh, uh, this formerly uh, bull in the china shop turned Jesus denier, turned coward, uh, working in this meek, restorative place back through. He's just kind of all over the place. Now is filled with the Holy Spirit. Where we are in our text today, he is filled with the Holy Spirit and not only declares what we covered last week, but now in these, these next three verses gives this succinct review of the gospel account and he starts out calmly, confident, confidently, and with great conviction about what he's saying. So, so you see the difference that's happened? So the crazy man, man, he's just the big gregarious thing, denies Jesus, he's sheepish, and suddenly Jesus is resurrected and Jesus restores him. The Spirit comes, fills him with the Holy Spirit, and now he's like, hey, men of Israel, listen to what I have to say. I'm not here to cut anybody's head off. I'm not here to swing my sword. I'm just here to declare the gospel. That's where we find ourselves today. And not only covers what he covered last week, but in these next three verses, you're going to see some very things. So in our text today, Peter starts off by speaking of Jesus and his incarnation. Look in verse 22 with me. This is what he says. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. And so what, G what Peter was saying was, Jesus came and he took on flesh and he became a man. Circle man in, that, uh, in your text. You're a writer in your Bible, highlight it, do whatever you want to do in your Bible, but circle that place, a man in verse 22. A man attested to you by God. He did mighty works or miracles and other signs and wonders that God did through him. And the vast majority of anybody who happened to be listening at that time probably either saw or they had heard about. They saw him actually do these miracles or they had heard about the miracles that he had done. And you know what we believe about these signs and wonders? What we believe about these signs and wonders that Jesus was do, would do was he was beginning to show a picture of the kingdom. When Jesus would heal a blind girl... What was he actually showing? Do you know? Here's what I think the, the, the Bible shows us is that when somebody was blind, uh, remember uh, the, actually a blind man at this time, uh, uh, there was a blind man and Jesus healed his eyes. And, and the disciples though asked what he would send in his family. Did somebody sin to cause him to be blind? Remember what, remember what Jesus said to him? He's like, nope. He said, he's been blind from birth to show the glory of God. That he was born blind. Listen, born blind for that very time that for him and Jesus to intersect so that, so that Jesus may be glorified in putting his hands on his eyes, whatever he did exactly, put his hands on his eyes and for his sight to be restored. He was born that way so that Jesus might be glorified in that moment. 
The very re- that was why he was born that way. That's bizarre to think about. That Jesus was glorified in that particular moment. Just a glimpse of what the kingdom of God might actually be when things are put back the way they should be. So Peter declared one of the essential Christian doctrines that we share with you in, in our Discover class. If you ever come to our Discover class, you, we'll talk about essential Christian doctrines, things we hold in a closed fist, things you have to believe to call yourself a Christian. Uh, we talk about those and, and we believe those and we hold to those here. Uh, so, so Peter declares one of those things and, and Christians around the world hold to this very thing that the Son of God became a man. That's called the Incarnation. He became like one of us. He took on flesh uh, and to become like one of us. He took on flesh. Think about that. He became an embryo. He became a little bitty, tiny embryo implanted by the Holy Spirit into Mary's womb. Did Jesus' life start at conception? I think it did. But Peter not only spoke of Jesus' incarnation, he also talked about Jesus' crucifixion. Look at verse 23. Verse 23 says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So, yes, this Jesus had been put to death by crucifixion. And the judge who sentenced Jesus to death and the soldiers who carried out their duties and the physical acts of crucifixion, they were Romans, they were professionals at what they did. They knew exactly what they were doing this. They did this many, many different times. They crucified people on the regular there. And that's Peter's reference in verse 23 when he refers to them as lawless men. And essentially saying that they were outside uh, the household of Israel. They were not Israelites. And so they were lawless men. They were not under the law of Moses. They didn't operate under the law of Moses. And so he called them lawless men. And Peter's words here were addressed to the people of Israel. Not the Roman citizens, but the people of Israel and the visitors who were present during the time of Pentecost. That's the people that he is talking to. But even if we point the finger at the Jewish leaders or Pontius Pilate or the Roman centurions in in verse 23, Peter unequivocally declares that Jesus was delivered up. What does the verse say? Jesus was delivered up according to the what? Look in your Bibles. Look what it says in verse 23. Jesus was delivered up according to the what? Which kind of plan? The definite plan and the what? foreknowledge of God. So yes, the Romans, he was arrested. Yes, the Romans scourged him. Yes, the Romans nailed him to the cross. However, who had planned this entire thing? Yeah, God, that's what the Bible tells us. Let me say this. Whether you believe it or not, whether you want to agree with what I say or not, Whether you want to say, I don't know if that's true or not, here's the way we stand at refuge. If the Bible tells us something, it doesn't matter what you think. Okay? Uh, We're going to trust what the scripture says. We're going to trust what the word of God says. You're welcome to bring your questions. You're welcome to bring your skepticism. You're welcome to bring whatever objections that you might have. And we're happy to talk with you about them. But we're not going to land where you land, if you land, outside the Word of God. We're not looking for my opinion. We're not looking for Pastor Paul's opinion. We're not looking for anybody else's opinion about what might be true. Where we're going to stand on is what the Scripture teaches us, okay? Just know that that's where we'll be, that's where we'll land, and that's actually where we will respond to you from is from what the Word of God actually has to say. So he was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So Paul reminds us of this in Romans chapter 8, 32, that sa- it says this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? 
the God who graciously delivered up his son to forgive us of our sins. And, and he's talking about this in Romans. How will he not graciously give us all things? Spiritual gifts, uh, anything that we ask for in faith uh, according to the plan of God. How will he not graciously give us those things? In Acts chapter 3, verse 18, that we'll get to in a few weeks, uh, we read that it was the divine purpose revealed through the prophets that the Messiah should suffer and Jesus fulfill that prophecy in part in his crucifixion. Now, it is true, like I've just said, that those who carried out the crucifixion, those who actually took Jesus to the cross, those people who scourged him and those people who whipped him, uh, they, they are guilty for their part that they played in uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, for his bloody death, uh, for his crooked trial that they actually had. And at the same time, because Jesus did die on a cross and pay the debt owed by, for sinners like you and me, and, those, and even for those responsible for carrying out this, this divine plan of God, this very heinous act that these men carried out points to the only way for the removal of their guilt and shows their assurance that they can have in the pardon that Jesus offers. And it's the only way for the removal of your guilt and to have you have assurance for the pardon that comes. This was the only way. For those men who scourged Jesus, who whipped him, who beat him, who punched him in the face, who made him a bloody mess and who nailed him to a cross for him to hang there and die, that that was the only way for their guilt to be removed should they ever repent and believe the gospel, believe that Jesus is who he said he was. And the same thing holds for you and me today. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says this, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, just another chapter over, not even a full chapter over, uh, 10.4 says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So there was this whole system in the Jewish system that as they sin and on the Day of Atonement, they would bring uh, uh, animals to, uh, to the temple and those animals would be sacrificed and uh, they would um, uh, ask for forgiveness for their sins. There was a thing called the scapegoat that they were, the priest would confess the sins of the people on and he would send this goat out into the, uh, uh, basically out into the abyss and, and it was a picture of their sins being put on something and they would go away to never see again. The blood of those bulls and those goats and all those things that were sacrificed during that time, none of that, none of that took away anyone's sin. None of it. Only the precious blood of Jesus took away their sin in the Old Testament. They were looking forward to the Messiah who was to come. This was a picture of the Lamb of God, the precious, perfect Lamb of God that who was to come. That's why they would talk about bringing a spotless lamb to the temple to be, to be uh, sacrificed because it was pointing forward to the spotless Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. So Peter declares that it took this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, crucified and killed at the hands of lawless men to redeem them from their sins and to redeem you and me from our sins. He goes on in verse 24 and says this, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And so as Peter's making this three-point uh, declaration, uh, he says that though the sentence was passed on Jesus by this earthly court and it was carried out by these Roman authorities, God said the, that, that man's debt had been paid for by Jesus and was now satisfied. Okay? That the payment for our sin debt had now been satisfied. And from the court of Roman authority, it got sent up basically to the Supreme Court or to the Supreme One that says, this has been satisfied now. This debt has been paid now. And so it was God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead 
which is the capstone of our Christian faith. And so you not only get Jesus coming to live like us and doing a, living a sinless life, you not only get Jesus who was crucified to shed his blood to cover your sin debt, you get the resurrection of Jesus, who, which literally is the capstone. You know what a capstone is? I talk about this here a lot. A capstone is the thing that holds it all together. A capstone is like if you're walking down a, a or walking through a, uh, an archway that's built with stones. If there is no capstone, that's the, that's the stone that sits in the very top. If you don't have the capstone, what happens to this entire thing? It crumbles. It can't stand on its own. It literally will fall. It has to be held up as you're building a, an entrance that you're going to use a capstone in. It has to be even held up for the capstone to be put in. But once the capstone is put in, what happens? It is secure and it is safe. And it is, you're able to walk through that and enjoy the benefits that that entryway offers. And the same thing is with the resurrection. Without the resurrection of Jesus, everything crumbles around us. The, this entire story of Jesus is the one that holds it all together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14 says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Without the resurrection, we're just wasting time. Okay? If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. It makes no difference. If Jesus has not been raised, if the resurrection is not true, go find something else to do. That's what we all should do. Find something else to do. But listen to me. If the life, death, and resurrection is true, if it is true... If Christ be raised from the dead, then it is imperative that you heed what this preacher is talking about today. It is imperative that you take seriously what the scriptures attest to about who Jesus is and what Jesus did and what Jesus is doing right now. It is imperative that you take inventory of your own life Examine your own life to know for sure that you are born again, that you have turned from your sin. You have recognized that you are a sinner and you need a savior. And you have trusted in Jesus' substitutionary atonement, which means he did it in your place to pay the debt to God. That's what substitutionary atonement means. Atonement means to satisfy the one who has something against you. Substitutionary uh, penal substitutionary atonement, penalty paid by a substitute, Jesus, to atone, satisfy uh, the God of the universe. That's what Jesus did for you and me in our place. And if that's true, and if that's what you have trusted in, if you're putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his penal substitutionary atonement for your sins, then your life should look different. There should be something different about you because the scripture tells us that just like uh, Peter was changed because the Holy Spirit came and indwelled him, you can't be the same if the Holy Spirit indwells you, than you like you were before. You just cannot. It's impossible. It's impossible for the Spirit of God to dwell within you and nothing to change in you. A changed life is the key. You've heard us talk about the golden ticket theology where you pray some prayer and, and you pray the right words and you say the right words and, and then you have this golden ticket. Yeah, I prayed. I prayed the sinner's prayer and one day, doesn't matter what my life has looked like, I'm gonna pull out my golden ticket when I die and go, remember what I did when I was a kid? I prayed that prayer, God, and you gotta let me in. There is no golden ticket theology unless the golden ticket uh, that you're trusting in is the finished work of Jesus and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit where you become a changed person. That's the only golden ticket. It's a changed life that you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God and a change occurs in your life. Need more proof of that? Let's keep going. Acts chapter 2, verses 25 through 28. This is what it says. For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for I 
Uh, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Now, um, this section is from Psalm chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. And from the early days, the Christian church has maintained that this exaltation of Jesus, because this is who it's talking about, this, uh, this exaltation of Jesus took place in fulfillment of God's promise to David and his reign as king. And so uh, there was a promise that there would be another one to come, that he would be greater than David, and this was, the, the church is held to the fact that this was pointing to Jesus. However, um, part of the early church in Psalm chapter 16 attested this particular text in Psalm to David. And they were saying, this actually talks about David. This was pointing to David. He was the one, he was the rescuer during the time. And so they were talking about the fact that, hey, this, is, this has to be uh, pointing uh, to King David. But Peter is pointing to this psalm, and he's telling the people of Jerusalem, listen, he's telling the people of Jerusalem, hey, this is not about David. You were probably mistaken because this text is not about David. Specifically, the people there need to hear this. That it's not about David at all. How do we know this? Because David's soul did go where? To the abode of the dead. David's soul or David's body did undergo corruption in the grave because David was still dead in the grave. Very much unlike Jesus. Jesus' body did not undergo decay. Jesus' body is still not in the grave. So this text, though the early people, the early, especially the people there in Jerusalem, thought this text referred to David, he was saying, this is not about him at all. This is about the rescuer, the one who is to come, the one who died on the cross, and the one who is alive now forevermore. It is hope. It is David's greater David, the long-awaited Messiah. And this is where he cl uh, clears it all up. Look in chapter, um, uh, 20, uh, chapter 2, verse 29. Look what he says. Brothers, I may say to you, with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. He's like, okay, we know where David's tomb is. He died, he was buried. Verse 30, being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So Peter argues, look, David is still in the tomb. That's what I was just saying. David is still in the tomb. Jesus is not. But God had told David there would be one from his line who would be great, the greater king. David's David. The king's king. The one who was not abandoned to the grave. The one who was not, the one who would not stay there. So he was making a clarification for those who had misunderstood this text for so long. And then he goes on and says this in verse 32, this Jesus raised up and that we, this Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses. And so this is the gospel message that we preach every week at Refuge. That if Christ be not raised, we are of all men most miserable. That if Jesus has not been resurrected from the dead, what are we even doing here? Why are we even wasting our time here? Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. Jesus was raised bodily from the dead. This is a true statement because it was witnessed by so many whose lives were radically changed. It's the same type of evidence I was just talking about that we look for today in people who claim to be followers of Jesus. Not a religious experience, though there probably is an experience that happens, but a life changed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Then he closes with this in verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Now, here's the thing. I want to talk to you who claim to be followers of Jesus today. You may think that you've blown it. 
even as a follower of Jesus, you may think, man, I've just blown it. I've been saved, but man, the stuff I've done, preacher, I've, I've blown it. Then my encouragement to you is to look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, the forgiver, the restorer, the one who makes beauty out of ashes, the one who calls you his own, the one who says that I am yours and you are mine and nobody snatches you out of my hand. The one who says you are a part of the family of God. The one who says and declares that you have been born again. The one who says that his spirit still lives within you. Look to Jesus. Remember what we just talked about, Peter after his denial. What did Jesus do? He came to him. Even after denying Jesus three times, at the worst possible time, Jesus came to him and said, you know I love you and feed my sheep. Jesus was restoring him. He'll do the very same thing for you. He'll do the very same thing for you. He has no desire for you to live in your misery. He has no desire for you to live wallowing in that sin that you find yourself in over and over and over again. He'll do the same thing for you. If you just go, God, I've blown it. He'll go, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Now listen to me, especially if you're outside the household of faith. If you're here and you're not a Christian, you're here and you go, I'm not sure if I'm a Christian, or you know for sure that you're not a follower of Jesus. You're here because maybe somebody made you come today. You're here and you wish that you could be anywhere else but listen to this cat talk. I'm talking to you right now. Just 50 days earlier, Peter, who wrote this part, or who was... He didn't write it, but he was speaking during this part. Uh, had, he was full of vigor. And on this Passover night, he fell into this most biggest plunge in history. And he's full of emptiness. Probably as profound of an emptiness as anybody could have been when that rooster crowed and, and he realized that he had denied Jesus three times. And that necessitated this this, uh, pre-Pentecost restoration of Peter on the shores of Galilee. We just talked about that. And after that, there was this fullness that, that probably he had never experienced before after being restored and seeing the resurrected Jesus. And and if you're here and you're outside the household of faith, then that's probably what you're searching for. You may not think that you're searching for the fullness that is found in the resurrected Jesus, but I'm here to tell you, as someone who's probably walked the same path that you have, I didn't become a Christian until I was 30. And so I get walking that path. I get what it's like to, to walk in debauchery a long time. I get what it's like to sin day after day after day and not even care. I get it. There's hope for you that's found in this same Jesus. The same Jesus that restored one of his great followers is the same Jesus that will give you life and give you hope and give you, uh, and give you eternal life found in Christ Jesus. We learned last week at the end of, of, of Peter's uh, beginning of his sermon, the people that heard what he said and they were like, what shall we do? Brothers, what shall we do? And maybe that's your question today. What shall I do? Their emptiness made way for their own fulfillment that was found only in three. We'll find out 3,000 of them responded to this particular preaching. 
3,000 people responded and said, their question was, what shall we do? Maybe that's your question. What shall we do? 3,000 responded then. If your question is, what shall I do today? Then our encouragement to you is to respond to Jesus. Respond in repentance and faith. You know, you know, sometimes I think that it would be really easier if Peter could just stand here in person and preach that sermon again. You, you know, uh, it's like, let's just bring him back and, and, and just let him, you know, let's just put him up on the screen and let him preach that sermon and see if the Holy Spirit will actually do what he did back then. You know what? That's not happening, right? So you're stuck with me. She's stuck with me here declare, because the Lord has ordained it that way. For you to be listening to what this guy says, hopefully in the power of the Holy Spirit, to say the very same things because what God did then is the same God that can and will do it now. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We regularly talk about what we do in our gatherings, especially when we gather together. Uh, we're we're gospel-centered. Uh, we, we talk about what Peter spoke of, about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We talk about the gospel. We preach the gospel regularly. We sing gospel-rich songs. But it's entirely possible, listen to me, it's entirely possible to hear good teaching or preaching for years and never really hear the great message of the gospel that 3,000 people responded to on that day. There are professing Christians in this room, professing Christians in this room, professing Christians that are watching us online today, but specifically professing Christians in this room who need Jesus. You probably know who you are. You've heard, but you haven't heard. It's possible to be a well-respected, well-taught, moral, lost sinner. Bound for hell. Straight up, you're not a good person. None of us are. We all need Jesus. Every one of us need the Holy Spirit to be poured out on us and awaken our hearts to the truth of the gospel. That there's hope found only in Christ Jesus. That we desperately need the faith to believe this message of the gospel. That Jesus is our only hope in life and death. You cannot do it on your own. Your sins, they are many. And you need someone to pay the penalty for your sins. Maybe you're asking, preacher, what shall I do? Today's text was about Peter declaring that it was Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, all done to make us his. What am I saying, preacher? That you too... Look to Jesus. His mercy is more. His mercy is more. Here's what you need to believe about these things about Jesus. He redeems sinners by his death and resurrection. Listen to me. He redeems, which makes you, he says, makes you whole again. When you redeem something, it becomes yours. He redeems sinners and gives you eternal life. He reconciles rebels like you and me. Remember I told you I was a rebel. I was the biggest one. He redeemed me and made, his, made me his. He'll redeem you and make you his. He expiated, there's a $10 word, or made amends for your sin. He purchased forgiveness for you by shedding his blood. We sing that. Forgiveness was bought by the precious blood of Jesus. 
He won his righteousness. He won the righteousness that you get in return for him getting your sin. It's called the great exchange. He who knew no sin became sin so that in him you might become the righteousness of, Christ, uh, of God in Christ Jesus. And all this is yours if the price is right. And it was. The price that was paid for your sin was the Son of God shedding his precious blood on a cross to cover your sin debt. A satisfactory payment for your sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious one. Hear these words today. Come to Jesus. Let's pray.